Welcome back to the YouTube channel. It's your favorite village boy, Mr. Ghana baby. And I'm back again with another eye-opening video. I know I've been surprising you all these days. That's why I'm telling you, don't be stingy with the content. Make sure you like the video because it's very important for others to see the video. Like, share, and subscribe and be part of this awesome family. This is actually the continuation of the previous video that I did with the CEO of the biggest airline in West Africa you all were complaining that that video was short know that your favorite village boy always got you you all know that barrister Alan Onyama was instrumental during the evacuation of Nigerians in South Africa during that xenophobia attack and I asked him that question why he did it. yeah I, just the same thing I was saying the South Africans we are fighting fellow Africans uh, killing some of them in the process and uh, they have come to take their jobs. What kind of jobs did these fellow African countries, brothers, uh, you know, take from them? The people who are taking the billions, the multinational companies, they didn't look at them. And they are talking about people who are artisans, painters, even helping their economy, helping them to do some of the poor jobs they couldn't, dirty jobs they couldn't do. They, those are the ones they were killing. And in order to uh, 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 kill somebody, you stigmatize that person. They call the names that are criminals, that are beings. For example, Nigeria, my country, is heavily stigmatized. If you're a Nigerian and you pass a crime scene abroad, they look, look, oh, you're a Nigerian, you must be the one. And so many Nigerians are in prison, in jail for what, what they don't know about. That is the truth. So, that stigma played out in South Africa too. They were killing these boys, going to their shops, burning, looting their shops for nothing. And the, some members of their governments were making statements that we are so undiplomatic, making people suspect there may be some connivance, official connivance. So I said, why must we as a nation take this? I decided to stop xenophobia itself. I'm a non-violence expert. I knew what I would do to stop xenophobia. There are two things that led me to South Africa. One, to bring respect to my country, Nigeria. No, three things. Two, to save the lives of both Nigerians and those of South Africans. The third one was for me to stop that xenophobic attacks. So I decided that the best thing to do was to send in my jets to evacuate Nigerians. Evacuation is not a good thing for any country. If every country starts sending planes to Nigeria to evacuate their citizens because of insecurity or whatever, it sends a wrong signal all over the world. And that wrong signal will affect that country adversely and that will make the country to have a rethink about what they've been doing. So that was what I tried to achieve, to save my, my national dignity, to save our honor, to bring back our people and save their lives, and ultimately to stop xenophobia. So when I sent in my jets, my white body planes, the triple sevens, to go and bring Nigerians back, free of charge, South Africa knew there was a problem. They didn't want that plane to land. They didn't want to give us uh, uh, permit at first. So it took a lot of diplomatic uh, talks before that happened. And they told the Nigerians, if you're going to go back, we are going to stamp your passport for 10 years, you will not come back to this country again. Yes, they tried to intimidate them not to go. Meanwhile, you wanted them to go before. Now I've come to take my people away. And because you know the adverse effect of that evacuation. But we end up taking them away. I went there twice, two times, to evacuate Nigerians. And that was when their government stood up to stop xenophobia. So I've succeeded in not only bringing you know, honor and prestige to our people, but also I've succeeded in saving the lives of our people and the lives of South Africans who may have been involved, in a, in, in, who may have been victims of counter attack. And of course, to bring stop the xenophobia, the xenophobic attacks itself. So, 
that was, that was the motivating, I mean, um, factor behind it. Uh, I love my country. I, I love Africa. And uh, I have nothing against the South Africans. Only what I did was to save the African continent. And that was when nearly I did evacuation. Everything stopped because the government sat up. The government of South Africa decided to sit up to, to stop it. You know, what about the names on, on the planet. aircraft? Yeah, like, all my planes what, are... What inspired that? I, I, I believe your surnames. Yeah, yeah, I believe in family. You see, a lot of decadence in the in society happens because of lack of family life. You know, when you believe in family, you will be wary. You sh you will be careful about the things you do, not to soil the name of your family. You think of what your family members will think of you. So I believe so much in family. That was why my first plans were named after my wife, my four children my mother and my dad. That was all we did. Then when I, I bought a subsequent ones, I named them after my uncles. My father had about five siblings. When I bought five more planes, I named them after my uncles and my aunties. When I... My mother had five ch nine children. We are nine, I'm number one. So when I finished my children, my wife, my father, uh, my mother, and my uncles and aunties, I went after my siblings, okay. the nine of them. So each and every one of them has an aircraft. When I finished my nine siblings, <laughs> I went into uh, cousins. Okay. So we are now cousins, my, co my first cousins. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> so this is, well, which is it? after yeah, cousins, yeah. which one? Uh, What's next? <laughs> yeah, maybe grandchildren. <laughs> How do you balance family demands, family and occupational demands? I've not been able to balance. I have to be truthful here. My family is suffering my absence. My children sometimes feel that they don't know their father and because. Um, and sometimes recently they accuse me of doing more for the public and doing more for everybody other than them. Uh, I spend my life, I start from here, I close maybe midnight and I go, I don't have any social life. Uh, in my young age, when I was supposed to be enjoying my youth in 2004, 2005, 2006, 7 and 8, it was when I was in the creeks of Niger Delta helping my country. For one year, my young family didn't see me. So my children, sometimes they say, one of my children, Obina, one day said, Daddy, but you know we don't know you. And uh, when he left, I was shedding tears. Because that's the truth. You see, for all the things I do, there's always a price for everything. My family is paying a price for what I do for this country and what I brought up myself to do for the larger society. As a person, sir, what, where do you draw inspiration from in all the things you do? From God Almighty. I fear God. I, talk, I think of God. I think of what God. Uh, maybe something. I feel the presence of God in my life. I feel that God loves me. And um, if not for God, maybe I may be no more now. Um, even when it seems. Everything is upside down. God always comes to my rescue. There should be one thing that keeps you moving from being a lawyer to a real estate developer and now MPs. We, we might not know, maybe in five years you can even yeah, there are more. It's not uh, Exactly. So what is that one thing that keeps you moving? What that keeps me moving is the desire, the unflinching desire to touch the lives of people because you're surrounded by object for poverty. You are surrounded by people who believe there was nothing there left for them. So that that is my drive. There are so many other businesses I'm going into or I'm already into. Uh, and there are some now I'm trying to explore. All because I want to touch humanity. That's all. It's not to make money. Aviation doesn't make you richer. It can give you fame, but it doesn't make you have more money. Yeah, there are businesses I do that give me money. Mm -hmm. uh, but aviation can only give you fame, but it gives jobs. 
well-paid jobs. It means well-paid jobs. What's your biggest wish for your country, sir? The, the biggest, the biggest wish for your country. Unity. That's my biggest wish. You see, Nigeria is a country of 378 ethnic nationalities that make up this country. That diversity is supposed to be our source of strength. Mm -hmm. However, it has become an albatross of a kind. It shouldn't be. We need each and every one of those ethnic nationalities to bring to the table their individual attributes. Mm -hmm. And that will make the country blossom. For instance, look at America, for instance. America is the melting pot of all ethnic nationalities in the world. You have Russo-Americans from Russia. You have Anglo-Americans from England. You have Franco-Americans from France. You have Austro-Americans from Austria. You have Igbo-Americans. You have uh, Ashanti-Americans. You have uh, 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 Outside-Americans. You have Yoruba-Americans. All over the world, the moment they get that passport, the only thing they profess becomes I'm American. In Nigeria, what we profess is our ethnicities. I'm Hausa, I'm Igbo, I'm Yoruba, I'm Ijo, I'm Wari, I'm Nupe. That's the only thing we profess. And that the, a Nigerian will see a fellow Nigerian abroad, he just throws his face away. Because he has noticed that we are not of the same tribe. I want Nigerians to be able to fight for each other as against fighting against each other. For example, if you're an Igbo man, I want to see an Igbo man fighting for a Fulani man. Fighting the federal government, say, look, federal government, these Fulanis, they need this, they need that. If you come from an Igbo man for the Fulani man, the Fulanis will love the Igbo. Mm. I want to see Fulani house fighting for the Igbo man, say, look, all the federal roads in Southeast are dilapidated. Why should it be so? You go to National Assembly and be fighting. Except and only when we fight for each other can we become a nation. I'm so happy that I met the CEO of um, the biggest airline here in West Africa. But you don't think establishing the biggest airline in West Africa is his greatest achievement ever? It isn't. It isn't at all. Is there anything you know you think I need to know? Yes, I know a little bit. I'll just tell you a little bit and you'll wow. continue and speak to him about more. But he was very instrumental in bringing about peace in the Nelda Delta region of Nigeria. Wow. Where there was havoc, you know, like kidnappings, the militants were overruling there. He came around and cleaned that up. So the Nigeria you see today might not be the best Nigeria, but it's a way better Nigeria than we had before. Amazing. Will he be able to tell me that? Trust me, he will. What you've done in Nigeria is something that the whole Africa is talking about. So we want to know, apart from the aviation industry, what has been your greatest achievement, apart from the aviation industry? I do not regard aviation as my greatest achievement in this country. Mm -hmm. To date, I think my greatest achievement was uh, bringing peace to the Niger Delta, uh, being instrumental to the peace we are enjoying today. You know, the Niger Delta region of Nigeria is the um, it's like uh, the economic uh, powerhouse okay. of the country. And if anything happens to Niger Delta, it will affect the entire country. The economy of this country is dependent on oil production in Niger Delta. So at a time when the youths of Niger Delta took to arms, feeling that that was the best way to address the issues of uh, marginalization, as they said, the country was in trouble. They started in 1998. By 2004, oil production had come down from 3 million barrels of crude, of, crude, uh, crude oil per day to about a meager 500,000 barrels per day for a population of about 180 million people then. So that was disaster, a beckoning, and waiting to happen. <clears throat> the militants were actually in control. The military couldn't contain them. Uh, foreign oil workers were being kidnapped. Americans were being kidnapped. The British people were being kidnapped. Chevron and Shell and the rest of them couldn't operate peacefully. Uh, oil installations were being bombed. 
And uh, in fact, most of the oil companies stopped prospecting um, onshore. They all moved offshore, maybe 100 nautical miles into the sea to prospect for oil. The boys still went there uh, to destroy the facility and took some people hostage as, uh, as uh, evidence to show that uh, they had what it takes to disrupt Nigeria. So Nigeria was being disrupted. The economy of the country was being disrupted. And uh, businesses were taking flights out of the Niger Delta region. Yeah. And a lot of people, non-Nigerians, were scared to come to Nigeria. Okay. The American State Department issued a warning to traveling US citizens not to come to Nigeria. So it was uh, another civil war was facing us. That was the time I stepped out and started thinking, how do I help my country? I'm a firm believer of what can you do for your country or for your nation, mm -hmm. not what your nation can do for you. So I stepped out and I decided to address the issues. One thing with me is that I do not look down on myself and nobody should look down on he or herself. I mean, I don't look down on anybody either. God has given all of us powers. You just have to explore yours. Exactly. So, so I believed in myself. I believed in what I could do. And my sincerity led me. And I started thinking, what do I contribute to address the issues of violent militancy in the Niger Delta? And that was when I remembered that nonviolence education was the best way to go. If military had failed, that's violence for violence. What else? I decided to bring in nonviolence education. But then I was not trained in nonviolence. I remembered that uh, Mahatma Gandhi used nonviolence education and nonviolence transformation to bring down British rule in India without having to you know, encourage his people to take to guns. Exactly. And they got what they wanted. What was the issue in the Niger Delta? The Niger Delta people felt that they were the ones producing the wealth of the country, yet nothing came to them. So they took up arms, believing that that was the best way, because nobody listened to them. But I, I decided to bring another, uh, another option, a more positive option, an option that is all loving, exactly. an option that will bring about a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. That was exactly what I did. So, because I was not trained, and because I knew that nonviolence education is so powerful, it works with the soul, it's the soul power. I remember that Dr. Martin Luther King used it in America to bring down official, official segregation in the US without having to encourage his followers to kill anybody. Lech Wałęsa of Poland used it in Poland in 1981 which is a solidarity group, to bring down the all-powerful communism, communist, communist government in Poland. So history is replete with examples where nonviolence worked and worked effectively. So I decided to do the same thing for Nigeria. First thing I did was to write to the University of Rhode Island Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies, Rhode Island, in the US, is the Center for Nonviolence. I now decided that they should give us admission to train me and train my staff, about 22 of us, so that I could have the expertise to be able to come down to Nigeria and go to the Niger Delta and confront the violent militants. But the United States wouldn't give us visas. We didn't get visas. We tried a couple of times, they didn't give us visas. So I wrote to the university, I said, look, bring down your faculty to Nigeria and we fund it for the sake of my country. It's not about going to America. Come down to Nigeria and train me, train my people, so that we'll be able to help in bringing down militancy. Remember, the director of that center uh, then was uh, Dr. Bernard Lafayette Jr. I'll show you some of his books here. Yeah. He was Martin Luther King's number one aide during the civil rights days in the 60s. So, so I didn't know I'd be able to attract that kind of international figure, but God has his ways of doing things. Yeah. So he answered, he wrote me, he said, look, 
you've been very persistent and very persevering. I would like to go to Nigeria to go and see this Martin Luther King of Nigeria. <laughs> that was what he was calling me. So because of my persistence and my interest and seriousness about what I wanted to achieve, yeah. he brought the entire faculty of the University of Rhode Island Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies to Nigeria. I funded it solely. No government gave me money. Nobody gave me money. I used my hard-earned money for peace to reign in my country. Yeah. So they came. After the initial training, they trained me. And uh, I went to South Africa, King Lutili Transformation Center, got some training. Then I came back to Nigeria and I went into the creeks of the Niger Delta and started pulling out these boys. I don't want to bore you about how we got to know some of them, to use some of them to get others. Because those are things we always want to use mm. next. So we don't want people to scuttle it. Mm. But I started pulling them out from the creeks bringing them to Lagos. We never did any of the transformational program in the Niger Delta because um, the militant leaders and their people and their followers could kill us or could scuttle it. So I was bringing them to Eco Tourist Beach Resort in Lagos, here in Lagos. I was training them there. Then from here, we moved them to South Africa to further their transformation. It's all about changing their mindset from believing in the efficacy of violence as a tool. And that was what we achieved. And once, you see, let me tell you something. Anybody who is involved in violence wants out of violence. Mm -hmm. They don't like it. The bomber, the suicide bomber doesn't like what he's doing. The terrorist doesn't like what he's doing. The armed robber, the kidnappers of this world, they don't like what they are doing, but they don't know how to live it. They don't know how to stop that kind of life. But nonviolence education provides the route uh, to liberation from the clutches of violence for them. Mm -hmm. So when they get it, they become so happy. If you give them a billion, they could trade it for a billion. That happiness they get, they could trade it for a billion dollars. They don't want to have anything to do with violence again. I, I, I so know so that was, was what I did. That was in 2005. Okay. I started in 2005 doing this. So after some time, the oil companies discovered that what I was doing was paying off. Shell was the first to contract me in order to enlarge the scope of the program. So when Shell started doing it, bankrolling me, it became, nonviolence became my household name in the Niger Delta. It wasn't long Chevron joined, started bankrolling me too. Then some other oil companies. Then in 2007, a new government took over in Nigeria, President Nyerere, I mean, he saw rest in peace. And they sent for me. But they got, he got a security report about me, what I was doing. And they all asked me, how did you achieve this? I told them it was all about my interest, just sincerity. And then the leaders were looking for me to kill. And Shell used to put me in different hotels. You know, for one year, I couldn't see my young family because of this nation called Nigeria. So, Yara Dua, long and short of the story, that was what led to the granting of amnesty to the militants. And when I started, remember I said, oil production in Nigeria nosedived to about 500,000 barrels per day. By the time I finished, it went to about 3 million, 2.5 to 3 million barrels per day. The country again is um, source of income back. That was what I did for this country. That wow. remains my greatest achievement. Not a Mr. Allen, before I let you go, if you had a chance to change one thing in Nigeria or the entire Africa, what would that be? Our perception of ourselves. Thank you so much for talking to me. I Thank really you. appreciate your time. Thank you.